Okay. And the other thing I want to do is pay my hundred dollars toward the the fund. That they're we're hoping every member. Puts oh, in yeah. Go to go to myrotary.com. Uh, you need a membership number. Ask Brian if he's added to you and and gotten a membership number for okay. you. Probably Last not. <laughs> but I want to pay it. So. I want, I'm, uh, let's see, wait a minute. Continue, stop the recording. With a background in maternal and infant health, formerly of University of Colorado Boulder, formerly of UC San Diego, founder and executive director of the nonprofit Nurturely, please join me in welcoming Emily. Yay. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Here, there, yes. everywhere? Okay. Lovely. It feels so counterintuitive because I see the mute on, so I'm worried that people can hear me, but I'm sure they can. Yay, yeah, we well, <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to share in this space. I know I just shared my bio, but I didn't really get to highlight my work with Nurturely, uh, which I'm really excited to share with all of you. Uh, so thank you. I, there's been so many incredible speakers. Thank you to Heather for arranging such an amazing speaker lineup. So I feel honored to be able to join that group uh, and really excited to share with you all about Nurturely's work. Awesome. But before I dive into Nurturely's work, I wanted to share my path to getting here and how out of the many, many causes that I am passionate about, how I arrived at perinatal health equity as being the cause that I would develop my life and work to. Uh, so as a psychological scientist, um, I was never drawn to experimental, or I was never drawn to clinical psychology, the diagnosing and the treating. Uh, my, my thought was always that, why are we spending time and energy uh, on diagnosing and treating adults and older children and youth and thinking about things way later in life when oftentimes many of these issues are starting earlier. And so to me, uh, taking a preventative focus was really how early can we go back in the lifespan? Um, so prevention to me was in its most simplistic form, focusing on babies, on the perinatal period. So perinatal means before and after birth. Um, so my basic interest in this period was purely from a perspective of wanting to be preventative in how we're approaching uh, human behavior, societal inequities, uh, and all of the big problems that we deal with. So my research in perinatal health took me internationally. I was in a very traditional uh, psychological science program where most people were doing cognitive neuroscience in labs with electrodes on babies' brains or other people's heads, uh, but I wanted to do my work out in the community. So I combined approaches from anthropology and psychology and public health and was out living and working in communities around the world. Um, as you saw, I was have a travel bug, uh, so to say. So I made sure that my graduate studies took advantage of that travel bug and I was able to work internationally in all of these wonderful places. Uh, but my learnings from that international research in a nutshell were one, that research is extremely biased um, and really contributing to inequities. So research in my specific area being infant and child development, perinatal health, um, but really all of research on human behavior, on human health is extremely biased. Uh, number two being that United States maternal and infant health systems are broken, broken, as broken as they can be. Uh, and through the avenues of global development and global health, we are often spreading unintentionally these broken systems. And then three, our cultures of support here in the US are missing. Um, this is a basic tenet of supporting human reproduction, supporting human communities, and uh, it's largely missing from a lot of what we see in the United States today. 
So what do I mean by research is biased? Uh, I'll just, I'm gonna give you my dissertation in a nutshell in the next four slides. So <laughs> essentially research is weird. This was an acronym that was created, uh, meaning Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, which is a very uh, nice way of saying the Western countries of the world, United States, Western Europe, uh, Australia, et cetera. And this is what is making up uh, comprising over 90% of our research on infant and child development on pregnancy and postpartum health. Um, and that's just from my spe specific example, but really what we know of human behavior is based on this very biased population, not only just in these countries, but within these countries, the research being conducted in university towns with people who have the time and money to spend their day taking their baby into a psych research lab to put electrodes on their head. So a very privileged and very specific population is essentially telling us about everything that we know about infant and child health and development. So it's not just the researchers that are the wealthy, what, it's the babies that you're doing the research on. It's the so participants it's, of the research, wow. the subjects of the research. And so if you think about it, 90, over 90% 90 of what we know uh, from the science of human development, from the science of pregnancy and postpartum health is from a very unrepresented example of the world, which is very uncharacteristic of the rest of the world. Um, so in my very narrow focus area, I was interested in parent-infant interaction, and what we know from this biased sample of research is very focused on, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a good parent? Well, you look at baby, you share eye contact, you teach them about things, you say, hey, this is a cup, and you point to it, and that's how babies learn language. Um, you read to them, and that's how, you know, uh, infants learn about the world and get ready for school and all these wonderful things, uh, but this is based on essentially a very strange sample. Um, so again, one of the tenets of this work, this 90, 95% Western-based work, is that caregivers who are responsive to infants by uh, every, for example, every time an infant vocalizes, you respond back with a vocalization that we know is proven to increase language development. However, this is not the only way of interacting with babies in the world. So essentially my work was to uh, expand our perspectives on how infants learn about the world, on how caregivers uh, interact with infants. Um, and it was through this specific focus on parent-infant physical contact as a modality for learning, as a modality for communication. Um, and just very simply uh, through different play-based paradigms or feeding-based paradigms showed that hey, guess what? There's other ways to learn about the world. There's other ways to interact with your baby. There's other ways to be a good parent. Um, and that was through physical contact with uh, between infants and caregivers. Uh, in particular, within the realm of physical contact, I was very focused on infant caring. So we know that caring is more than just a transport modality. It's really the method of human uh, caregiving and human parent-child interaction around the world. It is ubiquitous in every single culture. Uh, it is only here in kind of modern US-based society that we have stopped carrying our babies on our backs through as a modality for communication um, and learning and interaction. Uh, so that has been a, a primary focus of my work both internationally and here locally. But I think what's, you know, why should you care about this? Like, who cares? Who cares how people are interacting with their babies? Uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think it's important because this is a, what this biased body of research is telling us um, is not only interesting, you know, it's not only guiding scientific discussions, but it's actually uh, reverberating out throughout the community. So home visitors who, uh, you know, say whether someone is being a good parent or a bad parent or say whether an infant is you know on schedule or like delayed in their development is all based on this biased body of research um and so we have this situation where parents are given this long list of things to do hey you have to read 10 books to your baby hey you have to like show your baby 20 toys before the end of the day you have to do tummy time you have to do all these specific things in order to be a good parent in order to shepherd your infant through positive cognitive and physical development um, and what happens 
uh, is that, you know, what if a parent does not have access to the time and the money and the physical space to be able to spend their whole entire day uh, basically contributing to baby's positive development in this way. Um, and so the, the basic kind of premise behind uh, what I want to share from an equity perspective is that babies can get all of these positive interactions and all of these things that contribute to health and development through this very simple act of parent-infant physical contact through caring, which has been done since the beginning of human history. And one is, uh, yes, is a central, uh, central part of us being human, but two is a way to increase equity in terms of increasing access to the things that support infant health and development for all parents without having to devote time and energy to specific activities. Okay, so number two being that uh, U.S. maternal health systems are broken and negatively spreading. So what's happening in the U.S. today? Do we, are we aware that the United States is the only high income country where perinatal deaths, meaning deaths uh, in the pregnancy and postpartum periods are <laughs> increasing? Two thirds of these deaths are preventable. Um, Perinatal mental health is plummeting, including perinatal suicides and perinatal suicidal ideation. Uh, we have some of the lowest breast and chest feeding rates in the United States, and that's that's the baseline, okay? And then on top of that baseline, we have rampant uh, racial disparities. So Black and Indigenous infants and parents are two to four times more likely to die on top of that already uh, abysmal uh, mortality rate um, from pregnancy causes and from neonatal causes. Uh, black infants are nine times more likely to be offered formula in the hospital than white infants. Half is likely to be breastfed at three and six months, uh, more likely to have preterm birth and be in the NICU. Um, this is how we are entering, welcoming babies into the world. If you are a black baby in this country, this is how you're welcomed in the, into the world. If you are a parent that's giving birth, this is how you are rewarded for uh, growing the next generation in our country. Um, so baseline human rights in the U.S. are terrible. Often people say, okay, well, that doesn't happen in Oregon because we are great. No, it is exactly the same in Oregon. Um, there's less exposure to this. Maybe we are less diverse. So maybe people don't think we have these problems. We do. You can see the, the infant mortality rate in Oregon is exactly double for Black and Indigenous infants and parents versus white uh, and all other races of parents. Okay, and then lastly, we have cultures of support in the U.S., which, which are essentially missing from our societal infra infrastructure at the, both the policy level and the individual level. So this lovely graph shows you how unique we are in the United States being the only, not the only country, one of nine countries in the entire world that does not mandate paid federal leave for mothers, much less for fathers or other parents. Um, so at a policy level, we are failing. Um, and at a structural and community-based level, parents are going home from the hospital without communities of support built in. Uh, we're living far away from peers and support people. Uh, we have high rates of postpartum depression. And that has led to a situation where in order to have basic human rights, like recovering from childbirth, like being able to feed your baby with your body, um, like being able to survive childbirth even, people must seek education. They must hire help uh, through doulas and support people and nannies. Uh, they must gather social support on their own. Um, there's many great things about being independent and being an independent-based uh, culture, but here we have a situation where people who are just trying to have a, a basic human right of a positive birth experience and uh, a positive nurturing experience for their baby, uh, this is only accessible if you have the time and money and privilege to be able to hire and seek and find these things for yourself. This is not available to everyone. Okay, so in response to all that doom and gloom, uh, in 2017, I started Nurturely. Uh, this was inspired by international work, uh, <laughs> not in a glamorous way of being inspired, but in a, in a necessary way of like, hey, there's big things missing here in the US. Uh, we are unique, not in good ways. 
And there's lots, lots of work to be done in terms of building this basic community level infrastructure, building the policy level infrastructure to provide, uh, to guarantee these basic human rights of surviving and, and hopefully thriving through the pregnancy, birth, postpartum periods, um, and setting infants and parents up for a trajectory of uh, positive health and development at this really important time period. So Nurturely's work, we're a nonprofit organization. We believe infant, uh, wellness for infants and caregivers should be a right, not a privilege. This should be a human right that all people have access to. Uh, we promote equity through preventative education. So by preventative education, I mean we are focused on tackling the root cause of inequities. So one of these being systemic racism in healthcare. Uh, we know that, you know, the stat I shared before of uh, Black babies being nine times more likely to be offered formula in the hospital, thus, uh, you know, setting babies off for a trajectory where they are um, stuck on formula as one, but not afforded the benefits of breastfeeding and human milk. Um, this is purely bias, implicit bias, uh, systemic racism in healthcare. Um, so one of the, the workshops we've been doing, we've been able to train over 800 healthcare professionals. That was last year alone. Last year was the wow. first year that we, um, that this kind of transition from being a passion project for me to quitting my other job and this being a full-time thing and us devoting, um, you know, time and energy to develop a full team and have staff time towards Nurturely's work. Um, so this, all of these programs are, are have really uh, grown just from 2021 here and beyond. Uh, Brian and I were just having a conversation before this on the intersection between environmental health equity and perinatal health equity to uh, seemingly very different things. So pregnancy and postpartum health and climate action, climate justice, uh, climate change work. Uh, but actually the extreme heat from climate change, the uh, increased wildfire smoke, the increased pollution from climate change, all of that is linked to adverse pregnancy outcomes. So babies are more likely to be born preterm, uh, increased risk of stillbirth for parents who are exposed to this. And this was not, this is not just on a global level. That was Brian's first question of like, oh, this is a big global thing. Um, yes, it's also affecting our local community. So uh, organizations in Eugene last year, you know, we were leading programs for parents out in over a hundred degree heat and with uh, air quality index that were dangerous. And so if you're leading programs for parents, you're the first thing you have to know is how those climate emissions and climate impacts are impacting the, uh, the health of pregnant people and their babies, which is very negatively and very dangerous. Um, so this, this program, essentially our, our work um, in this area is focused on advocacy through education. So we are providing workshops and trainings for healthcare professionals, for community-based doulas and birth workers, for just the general public on like, hey, this is this is an issue, this is a root cause of inequities starting at birth in our society. Um, and through all of these different uh, workshops and educational opportunities, Nurturely's goal is to create a space where, uh, where all perspectives are brought to the table. So it's not just leading researchers, it is leading researchers, and it's also community-based um, indigenous wisdom, community-based wisdom, lived experience, at the same table and making sure to elevate and uh, and share all, all kind of ways of knowing about this uh, important problem. Our Milk Magic Educator Program is a lactation ed equity program where, you know, we started off uh, when we were first starting as an organization, we started off saying, hey, there's um, low rates of breastfeeding. There's low access to breastfeeding among Spanish speaking populations. So our first, our very first work as a baby organization was just leading breastfeeding trainings in Spanish. Um, we have since taken more of a systemic and more of an equity focused approach in, we are no longer the ones leading these workshops for parents. We are actually empowering, uh, not even empowering, removing barriers and equipping community-based educators who are uh, native Spanish speakers who are black and indigenous to be able to lead uh, 
uh, breastfeeding and lactation education in their own communities. So we actually don't do the direct service. We provide the support and the workforce development for people to um, share that knowledge within our own communities, within their own communities. Because currently we have a system where systemic bias, systemic racism in the healthcare system has led to a situation where sharing basic information about uh, how to feed your baby with your body or how to recover from childbirth, these basic human rights issues now require certifications and extensive education and lots of money and money to take the tests uh, when we believe you know, this should be open access information that everyone can uh, access and use and share. Uh, similarly, our Milk Food Moves Conference, which is an interdisciplinary perinatal health conference, again, bringing together all uh, areas of expertise um, in the community. So we also co-create cultures of support. Um, this involves uh, bringing together expectant parents. So we, we always try to take a preventative lens. So rather than waiting for the postpartum period, um, we, we try to proactively create uh, avenues and cultures of support for parents for postpartum preparation. This includes for the, the pregnant person, the birthing, uh, the non-birthing parent, Spanish-speaking parents, um, as well as an equity-focused group uh, that is white parents raising black and biracial babies. We have collaborated with the NAACP under Eric Richardson to create the Eric the Airy Sanctuary, which is now housed in our um, space downtown, which is a, a BIPOC-specific support and wellness space for parents here in Eugene specifically. Uh, our in-person programming in Eugene has included uh, baby wearing dance classes, which uh, all of our programs for parents are kind of fun and, and light, um, but have an evidence-based and an equity-focused uh, root and rationale behind them. Um, so Baby Wearing You by Londo is a bilingual uh, infant and parents dance and baby wearing class. And we're excited to announce in, in December, we just opened our perinatal lounge, which is our space here in downtown Eugene, right on 15th and Willamette, where we are now housing these programs. And I would say uh, we are able to offer a space in the community that is fun and comfortable and equity focused and inclusive for parents and babies in Eugene, which is uh, few and far between in this community. There's not many spaces that parents can go with babies um, and feel uh, welcomed and included and have bilingual and bicultural programming um, while still keeping our sights set on these bigger systemic issues uh, and the root cause issues of systemic racism, environmental racism, uh, barriers within systems that are impeding access to care and support. Um, but at the Perinatal Lounge, we've been able to provide access to vaccinations. We've been able to provide infant caring education. We've been able to provide in-person music and, and fun, uh, again, kind of lighter programming for parents and babies. Uh, and then lastly, I have kept one toe in the academic world, uh, continuing to conduct research to explore perinatal solutions to these broader inequities. So last year we published a paper on uh, infant caring as an intervention to increase perinatal health outcomes. So we were specifically looking at lactation in this study. Um, and very simply, this was not rocket science. This was not something I invented. Uh, this is, you know, something that is ubiquitous across human cultures of carrying your baby, keeping your baby close. Uh, those of you who have traveled, I'm sure have seen this in all different ways in all different countries around the world. Um, but something as simple as reintroducing that as a public health intervention for parents and babies in the U.S. Um, showed a dramatic increase in lactation access. I mean, surprise, surprise, kind of back to um, what humans have always known, what cultures have always known. We have just uh, impeded access to these really basic um, public health and perinatal health knowledge systems. Um, so again, if you're, if you're wondering why I care so much about lactation, why we're focusing so much on lactation, it's kind of the biggest bang for your buck in terms of perinatal health equity. Um, it's, it decreases parents, uh, not only the infant's disease risk, but the parent's disease risk, uh, decreases risk of breast cancer, decreases risk of ovarian cancer, um, and decreases risk of diabetes, um, supports infant brain development, infant uh, immune system development, 
decrease admissions to the hospital and COVID-19 being very important. Um, and we know that uh, from an international perspective, and now, you know, it had previously been only an international issue where formula companies uh, were violating human rights to the point of being criminal, of uh, getting uh, communities hooked on formula and then having no access to clean water, no access to uh, ongoing and safe formula. Um, and now we see that here in the US in the pandemic. So we've seen um, supply shortages, which have completely knocked out access to formula. So now all the parents who had no choice but to only feed their babies formula now don't have access to the formula are forced to add cereals and sugars and supplement the formula. Um, we now have water uh, issues in terms of lack of access to clean water in the US, you know, this is becoming more and more prevalent. So this is no longer like a developing country issue. This is a US based issue. Of we don't have access to um, the clean water and, uh, and the supply that we need to make this sustainable. Um, so the last thing I'm excited to share is that we're now also a human milk donation center at the perinatal lounge. So parents who are not able to feed their baby with their body can still have access to human milk. Um, so we're partnering with Northwest Mother's Milk Bank to be a community drop center for people that can donate extra human milk and then parents who need access to it can receive that access. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge our amazing team. This, you know, nurturally was my baby, but it would not be anything without uh, the team members who have co-created these programs with me, who have really uh, built the vision with me. Um, so it's been a really exciting journey to invest full time in this as of last January. So still very new, um, but being able to really um, offer what we can in terms of prenatal health equity. Uh, and I'll leave you just lastly with, with kind of my perspective on it, which is that, uh, you know, there's many causes to care about. There's many things to be concerned about in the world and abundance of things to be concerned about in the world. We have racial inequities and uprisings. We have impending doom from climate change. We have uh, public health pandemics. We have all of these things bombarding us every single day. Uh, and I stay focused on perinatal health equity because I truly believe that this is the cause that can touch all of these different things as being kind of a root cause, a root focus, um, an important intervention point for if we as a society invest in health equity in the pregnancy, birth, and postpartum period, um, we are then uh, disrupting the intergenerational inequities. We are disrupting the root cause of inequities from climate change. Um, so I'm excited about it. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. I would love to hear your thoughts. I'd love for you to visit us. Um, we have lots of things going on. So I didn't bring all of our flyers, but uh, it's all on our website. And I'm happy to share more via email or, or anything else. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, we will take questions in person and online. And if you'd like to be heard, please come up to the mic if you're in person, uh, assuming you don't want me to botch or restate your question for you. Oh. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the good work you're doing. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I have a 12 part question. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll hone it down to three. Um, I, I'd be very interested to know if you could just briefly describe your relationship with the perinatal, perinatal medical community, uh, particularly if you've been able to find any champions within the perinatal medical community that, uh, that can help you carry out your mission. Secondly, I'm, I'm specifically interested you didn't talk about sort of like your funding model, your sustainability model, but uh, specific to that, your relationship uh, in Oregon to the Oregon Health Authority, and particularly to the Oregon Health Plan community, and whether or not there's been any opportunities to maybe be a, a, provide, a, have a provider contracts and so forth with that population. Yeah. Good questions. Uh, I'll answer the second one first. So Oregon Health Authority, yes, we have partnered with them on the vaccination efforts. I partnered with them through a few different avenues. Um, so partnered with them for the vaccination efforts um, as being kind of an immediate, uh, you know, responsive need, um, but have also partnered with different sections of OHA through um, 
the work addressing systemic racism in the healthcare system. So we have led specific trainings for uh, the statewide Oregon home visiting community on racism and perinatal care. Um, that's an ongoing contract that we're uh, developing more trainings for this year. Uh, I, we also did a really interesting collaboration with the Oregon Early Hearing Detection and Intervention uh, segment of OHA, which does early hearing detection and intervention in infancy. Um, so it, we led a workshop on the intersection of uh, racism and autism, as in death uh, discrimination and prejudice, um, and how that intersects with early intervention and services for infants and pregnant and postpartum parents. Um, so there have been a few different good uh, collaborations with OHA. And then as far as broader healthcare um, partnerships, uh, that has been, you know, the main champions of our work who are very much in alignment are the community-based birth workers and community, you know, the people who are on the ground in the community who are front representatives of the community who see these inequities and, um, and, and champion the need for this work. Uh, it is harder buy-in from the, the farther you go up the hierarchy in the healthcare system. So, um, you know, the top tiers of hospital systems, uh, there is some buy-in and we do have some good partnerships. We have some partnerships with Peace Health um, in this work, but um, it's tough because it, it's, you know, we are addressing the system and people who are part of the system, you know, it's a tough thing to kind of reconcile with that, you know, being part of the healthcare system that is harming people means that you are part of the system that is harming people. Um, so it's, it, it, they're complex conversations for sure. And some people are, are at the table and are ready for it and some people aren't. I'll follow up with you. I yeah. have a suggestion. Maybe. Awesome, thank you. Mm. Jim. I'm up to this microphone, do I? Yeah. I'll speak at it from here. Sure. From, out from the back door. Um, in any case, I, I've been uh, personally, personally uh, witnessed the the results from a from a from a great multinational charitable corporation introducing formula to Africa, which they mi then mixed with brackish water, wow. and it was so much better than mother's milk. I mean, how how could they have how could they have possibly rejected it? I mean, our our multinationals are not benign. And they and they and they they work they absolutely many of them work absolutely work against us strictly for profit. Yep. Absolutely. And it's, uh, yes, and I that was Nestle. Yeah. Yeah. You know what they sending out of date shipments? I mean, the list is long of human rights violations. And I'm sure you all have seen this in other countries. And I think the the interesting take home point is that, you know, we often see this as like, oh, this is an other country problem. And for, I love this group because this group is so international. Um, often the conversations I'm having in, you know, this lactation of the human rights issue conversation are people don't see it because they haven't been touched by it in that way you know it's it's like oh breastfeeding is a choice and like la 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 don't you know affect my choices and um and that has been the case in the U.S. because there's you know different levels of privilege but if you look at it from the international perspective of corporate human rights violations um like the example we just heard uh the perspective is different and so that's that's what we're trying to share which is kind of unique in this space if you don't have a global perspective um but like i mentioned now this is getting closer and closer to home because we do have decreased access to clean water our privileges of not having pandemics and and always having clean water are leaving us um so it's becoming more and more closer to home laura Thank you so much. This it's amazing uh, work that you're doing. So I I was just wondering if you could just spend a couple of seconds talking about how keep, uh, the Spanish speaking community or whatever you want to call us went from you never do anything but breastfeed your baby to not breastfeeding your baby. That that's just you go to Latin America. It's just unheard of unless people are starting to bottle feed, which is very peculiar in yeah. Latin America. 
right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, though, I mean, many of us have been there and some of us grew up there. Um, so how did that happen? And yeah. uh, maybe you could spend a couple seconds on that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, this is one of the things that is most frustrating. I, I didn't really go into detail when I said the broken US healthcare system is spreading. It's it's not just the system that's spreading, it's the culture that's spreading. Um, and that has created harm the world over, uh, being that our practices, uh, which are usually often misguided in this space, then reverberate out to other countries through many different channels, some being just through popular media, um, some being through direct global health and global development efforts. Um, I was on a global health career trajectory uh, working as a postdoc in India with the Gates Foundation um, and just saw how India was just eagerly um, copying basically US practices. And I was like, but our system is, you know, our system is broken. There was no regard for that. It was, you know, still just such a desire to emulate the U.S. and um, have the developed systems and the high quality healthcare that high quality healthcare that we have. Um, and so, our systems and our our practices of birthing and postpartum were being directly um, emulated in India and and the world over. And so, that it's the same with breastfeeding. It's the same with baby wearing and carrying your baby. I mean, that was something that um, was seen as primitive and was seen, same with breastfeeding, was seen as primitive, um, not as modern and advanced as having access to the science of formula, um, you know, the consumerism of the formula. And of course, all of this is based in and breeded through marketing um, and the giant budgets of, of US-based corporations. Um, so yes. We are at fault for the low breastfeeding rates around the world, I would say, um, either indirectly or directly. Um, the kind of grossest part of this problem now is that breastfeeding, baby wearing, you know, um, midwifery led births are now uh, seeing a resurgence in the US. And who has access to this resurgence in the US? It's the whitest, most privileged, uh, most, you know, money having parents who now choose to have access to these things after they were basically, you know, stolen and eradicated from the communities that originally had these practices. I do have to ask you, yeah. is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is a question. Mm -hmm. I work every day, 12 hours a day on Nurturely. I believe there's hope. We are working at the systemic level. We're working at the individual level. Um, I believe the answer to this is cultural change more than anything. Um, and cultural change is slow and complex, but it, um, you know, I, I believe it is a all society problem. It's a cultural problem, um, which is why our work isn't focused specifically on like, hey, pregnant parent, here's, you know, these things that you should do, or like, here's education for you. It's really more about education and systems change, cultural change at the broader level. People who aren't currently pregnant, like that's the more important demographic, honestly, for this work of like, it takes all of us. It takes employers to change their policies. It takes healthcare administrators to change their policies. Um, it's a real shift and reframe in how we are approaching health equity, how we are approaching pregnancy and postpartum, how we are investing in the next generation. Our last question, well, our second to last question will be from Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks so much, Emily, um, for a really <clears throat> interesting talk. Um, my question for you relates to some of your international work, and I can see that you've you've spent time in, in many different countries, um, one of which I noticed was Vanuatu. And I'm curious how you, were you a Peace Corps volunteer or how you um, found your way there since it's relatively uncommon for people to even have heard of Vanuatu in this country? It is, you're right. Um, <laughs> That was through academic research connections. Um, if you have spent time in Vanuatu, which it sounds like you have, uh, Vanuatu is one of the countries with the richest linguistic diversity in the world. It's one of the country, you know, we, there's now very few countries in the world that have um, traditional, uh, not, you know, horticulturalist uh, small scale societies. Um, so, 
as such, it is the object of attention of many anthropologists and academic researchers for that reason. Um, so, you know, that has many problems in itself of researchers coming in to study and observe. Um, so, you know, I acknowledge that um, and have gratitude for what I learned from those experiences and also try to um, incorporate community-led, um, community-based research practices in future research that we are doing, um, because even just being kind of anthropologist observers in countries like this can be uh, problematic in some ways. But I will say that it was a joy to live in Vanuatu. Uh, I learned a ton and um, yeah, it's, it's a blessing to have places that aren't touched or um, ruined by a lot of Western cultural practices. So it's wonderful to see those places um, as they as they still are in many ways. So where is it? Uh, in the middle of nowhere in, in uh, my no, it's in uh, Micronesia. It's where? In Micronesia. What is that? What's the closest landmark? Um, um, it's I would say it's um, it would be closer to Australia, New Zealand, and then Fiji, kind of between Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji in the south, southern South Pacific. It was in, I think, season five of Survivor. Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Our last question will be from Ruben. Yeah, sorry, I missed your bio. So mm. do you have children of your own in relation to what you're doing? I don't, and that's a that's that's a good question, which is why one of the reasons why I champion this work as someone who doesn't even have babies yet. Like I feel like it's an everyone problem, and often people come into perinatal health work or lactation equity work because of their own traumatic, awful experiences with U.S. healthcare systems and healthcare inequities, and then become passionate about this. Um, but our approach is like I wish this was. Uh, integrated into elementary and high school education. You know, I wish this was something that was talked about more prevalently. Um, among, you know, it really should be something that everyone cares about besides people who are just in the pregnancy and postpartum period. Um, I, like I said, am currently working on developing this organization from the ground up. It's a 12 hour a day endeavor. I currently don't have time for babies, but um, I'll let you know if that is on the right. <laughs> Keep us posted. All right, well, thank you very much, Emily, for the presentation. Fantastic. Okay, now we will transition into announcements. And I have